Taken together, our Machan and McBoyle cases force us to contend with the following puzzle. Since courts cannot simply punish conduct that is clearly wrongful, the wide condemnation of the decision in Machan and cases elsewhere such as Shaw versus Director of Public Prosecutions in the UK indicate that what violates a vague standard like public morals ought not automatically count as a crime. If we agree, we have then to ask, how can courts punish conduct that is not clearly forbidden by statute? The answer suggested by Justice Holmes's opinion in McBoyle is they can't unless the line between what is criminal and what isn't couldn't be any clearer. If the statutory line could be clearer, then the so-called rule of lenity concedes to the defendant who can argue she did not have fair warning. The rule of lenity requires that ambiguities in the statute be resolved in the defendant's favor, which ensures fair warning by resolving ambiguity in a criminal statute so as to apply it only to conduct clearly covered, according to the court in U.S. v. Lanier. Clearly covered. This statement of the rule of lenity is misleading. All language is vague to some degree, and so it would cripple the state's effort to protect the public if only unambiguously precise statutes could be enforced. An ambiguity is present whenever two equally plausible interpretations of something can be given. Consider the celebrated duck-rabbit figure. Is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? Go figure. With language, ambiguity abounds. Consider this statute. Making it an offense knowingly to cause a bank failure. Suppose B1 blows up a levy and B2 loots a financial institution. Can neither of them be convicted? No court would give the defendants the benefit of the doubt and acquit them until it had attended carefully to context, the wider context in which the language was situated. Is it in a code section dealing with waterways? In that case, bank means riparian boundary. Or is the language embedded in a statute governing the financial system? If so, bank means a financial institution. A recent case shows us how the rule of lenity is typically applied today. In Smith v. United States, the defendant's sentence was enhanced because he had used a firearm in connection with a drug transaction. The statute reads this way. Any person who, during and in relation to a drug trafficking offense, uses a firearm shall serve a minimum sentence of five years. The key word in the court's analysis is uses. The thing is, Smith was trying to barter the gun for drugs. The evidence showed no intention on his part to use the gun as guns are typically used. An economist might say that Smith had taken the gun with him to the transaction solely for its exchange value rather than its use value. Now, we might think the rule of lenity would come into play in the defendant's favor. It does not. The court concedes that such language normally invokes an image of a firearm's use as a weapon. That's the popular picture, anyway. But never mind that. 
But whether as a weapon or as an item of barter, it creates a grave possibility of violence and death in either capacity. The Smith Court resolves the ambiguity by consulting what it presumes to have been Congress's wider purpose. In Moscow, another case, not featured in the casebook so much, the Supreme Court gives a much less misleading statement of the doctrine. Because the meaning of language is inherently contextual, we declined to deem a statute ambiguous for purposes of lenity merely because it was possible to articulate a construction more narrow. A merely facial ambiguity will not carry the day for the defendant. The court continues. This court has always reserved lenity for those situations in which a reasonable doubt persists about a statute's intended scope even after resort to the language and structure, legislative history, and motivating policies of the statute. Note, even after. The court does not stop, as it did in McBoyle, as soon as it confronts a deviation from a popular picture. It starts there and consults structure, legislative history, and legislative purpose. Had the McBoyle court completed this exercise, I somewhat doubt that McBoyle would have benefited. As though to leave no possible doubt, the Moscow opinion concludes by stating that the rule of lenity is a doctrine of last resort. A doctrine of last resort for the court, that is. It may also be a last resort for a defendant. It is good to be clear that the rule of lenity has nothing to do with what the defendant actually thought. In other words, it is not a mens rea defense. Similarly, the rule of lenity is not to be confused with a model penal code reliance on official statement later invalidated defense. These are not the same. The rule of lenity concerns what the statute means, not what the defendant thought it meant. If, despite all the court's interpretive efforts, it cannot be sure the defendant's conduct is covered, the rule of lenity demands a, a dismissal. Whether the defendant believes she was committing a crime or not is neither here nor there.